الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so we were still doing the battle of Tabuk we're going to be spending uh, quite a number of lectures on the battle of Tabuk and it is in fact the final of the the battles of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so much Quran came down in fact basically the entire uh, surah al-Tawbah surah al-Bara'a it came down because of the battle of Tabuk so we will have quite a lot of discussions and details and the battle of Tabuk as I mentioned in my last uh, lecture is not a actual battle it's actually an expedition no actual fighting took place but so many stories happened within the battle that are of interest so many incidents so many tangents uh, the issue of uh, we're going to talk about in uh, maybe not next week or we'll begin next week the issue of the hypocrites building another masjid and uh, basically the, uh, the 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 fitna that that caused and today inshallah ta'ala we will discuss one of the most uh, popular stories. I'm sure many of you heard, heard, have heard of this story, uh, but it's always good to refresh our memories and to go into more details. It is one of the most popular stories of the seerah, and it is uh, the story of Ka'b ibn Malik and what happened to him in the battle of Tabuk. The story of Ka'b ibn Malik and what happened to him in the battle of Tabuk. And it is really a lesson for each and every one of us about committing sins and about how to make up for those sins. And uh, obviously, this is a story I have, I have no doubt that those of you who have read uh, or even you know, are regular attending khutbahs, you must have heard this story. But wallahi, and I have read this story, subhanAllah, so many times in my life. Every time I read it and every time I refresh my memory, really it just hits. It's such a soft and beautiful story. So we never get tired of going over and over, especially uh, examining it bit by bit and paragraph by paragraph. And so today, and I don't even think I'll finish, even though it's just one story, I don't even think I'll finish in one lecture, probably have to do the half of next lecture just about the story of Ka'b ibn Malik. Now who is Ka'b ibn Malik? Ka'b ibn Malik is one of the early converts from the Ansar. He converted He's from the tribe of Banu Salama, by the way. And the tribe of Banu Salama, the tribe of Banu Salama, uh, we mentioned their hadith a number of times. The Banu Salama, they lived around Masjid Al-Qiblatayn. In fact, that was their masjid. Today's Masjid Al-Qiblatayn was their local masjid. That was where they would regularly pray. And they wanted to move closer to the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ said, yeah, that, uh, 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 that oh, oh, Banu Salama, that, O Banu Salama, stay where you are. Your footsteps, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, record them. And some scholars say that Surah Yasin's first verses that uh, we write what Maqaddamu wa atharahum is a reference to the Banu Salama. Some scholars say this. So, Ka'ab ibn Malik is from this tribe. He converted to Islam before the Hijrah. So, he's one of the very few of the Ansar that has the honor of converting to Islam before the Prophet ﷺ emigrated and he in fact took part in the Bay'at al-Aqaba and so he's one of the 70 odd of the Sahaba, 70 plus of the Sahaba who took part in Bay'at al-Aqaba so he's of the elite of the Ansar he's of the elite of the Ansar and his story is mentioned in every book of Hadith and in Sahih al-Bukhari, we have a three-page narration from him in the first person, which is why this story has been preserved, because he narrated it in the first person. Now, when somebody narrates in the first person his own story, what is the benefit in that? Why do we care even more when it's in the first person? Well, firstly, the detail. In terms of authenticity, every Sahabi who says something, we say is authentic. But in terms of vividness and detail, what else? When it's in the first person. It's very personal. So what are you going to get from a personal story that you won't get from an impersonal story? Emotions. Emotions. Excellent point here. And this is what we notice. That's why one of the reasons why this story is so painful and the other long story in the seerah that is narrated in the first person is the slander of Aisha. These two stories in the seerah, they always hit home. One of the reasons they hit home is because they're both narrated in explicit, vivid detail in the first uh, person and as we said this hadith is in Bukhari but I'm in my lecture today I'm not only going to be utilizing Bukhari I'll also be utilizing a tabari in his tafsir has more details and other books of hadith and as is typical I'm not going to tell you each one you can just you're going to have to just trust me in this regard that we've synthesized all of the narrations uh, to make it one flu uh, f um, smooth flowing story so Abdullah ibn Ka'b ibn Malik one of his sons who became the guide of Ka'b ibn Malik when Ka'b became blind later on in life, said, I heard my father say. So the Isnad goes through his son, Abdullah ibn Ka'b 
uh, his son. And Ka'b ibn Malik lived a long life. We'll talk about his life after this incident next week. Uh, but for now, just realize that he eventually became blind because of old age. So his son would take him around. And his son said, I heard my father narrate the story of the Ghazwa of Tabuk that he failed to take part in. And Ka'b said, now it becomes first person. I never remained behind any Ghazwa that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fought except Ghazwa to Tabuk. But also Badr, he said. But Badr, nobody criticized anybody for not participating because Badr was not meant to be a war. It was in search of the caravan of the Quraysh and then the Muslims met their enemy. No, what he begins here by saying that I never remain behind in any Ghazwa except Tabuk. Then he says, but also Badr. But then Badr is not that big of a deal because Badr was not mandatory. Badr was voluntary. It wasn't understood to be a battle. You all remember the battle of Badr, that it was fighting, not, it was, sorry, it was not a fight in the beginning. It was a raid in the caravan of Abu Sufyan. And so he said, as for Badr, I didn't go, but nobody blamed anybody for not going. But the one that they blamed people for, for not going, is the battle of Tabuk. And he said, I witnessed, and I was there on the night of the Bay'at al-Aqaba, with the Prophet of Allah, when we pledged our Islam. And to me, that is more precious than Badr. And I would not substitute that for Badr. Even though Badr is more popular amongst the people than Bay'at al-Aqaba. So this is one first paragraph, so profound, so full of meaning. Let's digest it bit by bit. The first point, what I found really interesting here is his own son is narrating the story in such vivid detail and in it are so many mistakes and emotions of Kaab. And those of us who are parents, most of us in this room, how awkward is it to tell your son of your own mistakes? How awkward is it to confess basically and tell your son, I failed in this regard. But wallahi, this is the best tarbiyah imaginable. Because you are teaching your son how? By example. Nobody is perfect. Nobody. And the fact that Ka'ab ibn Malik is telling his son, Takhallaftu, I remained behind and I did not go on Ghazwat Tabuk and this is what happened to me and then the, uh, all of the punishments that came and the vivid detail I mean the first thing that struck my mind Wallahi is yani, as a parent you try to hide your faults from your son you try to make yourself to be the perfect man and this is subhanAllah Ka'ab telling his son I really messed up and I want to tell you my story of how I messed up why? because all of us mess up and by telling your son, by telling his son, I want to tell you what happened, because in the end, there's lessons and morals to benefit from, right? That yes, he did mess up, but what he did made up for his mistake. So the lesson is not in the mistake, the lesson is how to correct that mistake. Also, we have over here an interesting psychology of the pride of the Sahaba, legitimate pride. Now we have always been taught pride is haram, pride is haram. Well, that's very, a bit generic. Pride meaning arrogance is always haram. But pride meaning having a sense of Alhamdulillah, I did this. And if it's a legitimate thing you've done. This type of word that we call in English pride, this is not just halal, it is wajib in some instances. You should feel proud of being a Muslim, meaning what? That Alhamdulillah, Allah has guided me to Islam. Alhamdulillah, ladhi hadani lihada. You should feel in that sense proud, meaning it's an accomplishment that Allah has given. And here we have an interesting point. The Sahaba are having their CVs in their minds. What have I done? And by the way, we learned this from Abu Bakr, from Umar, all of the Sahaba, they once in a while they list, I did this and I did that. And this is natural that you are feeling a happiness of your khidma to the religion of Islam, your service to the religion of Islam. So Ka'ab mentions that of my services, I never remain behind in any battle. I participated in every battle. Of my services is that I witnessed Aqaba. And for me, that makes up for Badr. Even though he said, amongst the people, Badr is more famous. But for me, Aqaba is more precious. Why is it more precious? Because Aqaba was smaller, 72 people. And also because Aqaba, the Muslims converted before meeting the Prophet So it's a big honor. So he said, I would rather 
I would never substitute Aqaba for Badr. So notice in his mind, he's thinking of all the good that he's done. So the question to all of us, when was the last time we sat down and thought, what good have I done in this life for the Akhirah? Because this is a sign of Islam. Muhasabatu nafs. You think about what positives I have done. And we see this in the seerah and in the, in the lives of the Sahaba constantly, that they're thinking of the good they have done. So that they are preparing, they want to increase their resume on the Day of Judgment if you like. And that's something, subhanAllah, many of us, all we think about is the dunya, the world. We think about job, we think about family, we think... But here are the Sahaba in their minds is, what have I done for the sake of Allah? That's on their minds. And this is what Ka'b is telling his son as well. And no doubt this is a badge of honor. And we also have over here that he's setting up the stage for making an excuse for his mistake by mentioning his positives. In other words, everybody makes mistakes, but overall, look at my biography. He's telling his son basically. Overall, I participated in every battle. And I participated in the, in the incident of, of Aqaba, the Bi'atul Aqaba. So he's establishing his pattern, his resume, if you like. He mentions his good points. And this is human nature as well, that you want to judge somebody not just based upon the one mistake. We should say this is authentic human nature. Many people, unfortunately, they, they'll pounce on the one mistake. But the, the good methodology, the proper methodology, and, and many of our scholars mention this, if a righteous person makes a mistake, it is not the same as when an evil person makes the same mistake over and over and over again. And this is Ka'ab as well, kind of setting up the stage that, look, I have a track record of being a good person, participating in every battle, I messed up big time in one battle. That's what he's going to say now, right? And here we learn again that history, repetition, habit plays a big role in passing judgment on somebody in this world and even in the next. And therefore, the righteous man who slips up, in some ways, we are more lax with him, inshallah ta'ala, if he repents and comes back, than the one who is known for his laxity and is never righteous, then we understand that it's not the same thing. Uh, and this is what Ka'ab himself as, uh, is saying. Then he goes on in the story. As for the battle of Tabuk, he said, and what happened to me, I was never more physically fit or wealthier than right before that battle. I have no excuse for not participating. Neither was I physically sick, nor did I not have the money to do so. By Allah, he said, I swear by Allah, I had never owned two camels before this point in time. But at the battle of Tabuk, I had two camels. So he's talking about his own personal status and wealth. Now, the, the two legitimate reasons for not participating in Tabuk, number one, you're infirm, you're weak, you're blind, you're limping, you cannot go. So khalas, you're excused, right? Very old person, very sick person, very whatever, okay, you're excused. And number two, I don't have money. Remember, in those days, the battles were financed by themselves, or if the Prophet had some surplus, he'd give it to you. The, there was no paid army at the time of the Sahaba. The Sahaba self-financed themselves when they went for expeditions. So if you didn't have a camel, or you didn't have a colleague or friend who would share his camel, because typically a camel was shared by either two or three people. So if you didn't have a camel, nor did you have a group with a camel, well then you're not going to walk all the way back and forth, and therefore you are excused. But Ka'ab says, I had no excuse. Physically I was strong, financially I was wealthy, and he also said, never did I have two she camels before this point until the battle of uh, Tabuk. Now, it also shows us the poverty of the Sahaba. It is the norm in our times to have, mashallah, not just two, but three she camels, right? Three cars, all of us we have. Two or three cars is the standard. It is the norm. For the Sahaba, the average Sahabi did not own a single camel. And that's why even the Prophet ﷺ did not own a camel up until the night before he emigrated to Medina. He did not even have a camel. He had to purchase one from Abu Bakr. Owning a camel, which is the bare minimum, you know, to go around was a luxury for them. And this shows us that early Islam, and we know this from so many evidences, really it was, the poverty really was well known. That the money started pouring in, in the next generation. As for this generation, the Sahaba, the Prophet they really had to struggle. So it's a big deal for him that he has two camels. And that's quite literally two cars in our times. Whereas for us, we cannot live in this land, most of us, without two cars. It's like something almost impossible for us, you know, to live. Most of us have, mashallah, three or four. Some even have five or six. I have Allahu Alam, you know. But the point being, this is now the norm. Whereas back then, subhanAllah, even one was a big deal. Then he goes on, he says, whenever the messenger wanted to undertake an expedition, 
he would always hide his intention. He would always pretend he's going to a different area until it was the time of the battle. And of course, this is not lying. This is Tawriya. So he doesn't say, I'm going to X and then he goes to Y. Rather, he leaves Medina in the wrong direction. And people make assumptions. He doesn't say anything. People make assumptions. He must be going here or there. Then he turns around and he goes to where needs to be gone. And obviously, this is of the simple tactics of war. That in, when you're going to a battle, you don't announce the day and time unless there's you know, a legitimate need to do so. Generally speaking, you surprise attack. And that's what nor, the norm is throughout all of the, uh, the battles of the world. So the Prophet ﷺ would generally not announce. However, when it came to the battle of Tabuk, he announced. We talked about this last week. Why did he announce? Why did he announce? Not just because it's a test. This was not a battle that would be simple and easy. You can go and you come back in 10 days or a week. This was a battle the furthest distance they had ever traveled. It was the largest enemy. What else? The season. The season. It would be the end of the summer season and then harvest right after that. August would be harvest time. And so all of these preparations need to be done. You cannot just tell the Sahaba to leave and then they have not taken adequate preparations for their own travel and for taking care of the people left behind. So in this case, Ka'ab said, the Prophet Sallallahu because of the severe heat and facing a long journey and the desert and the great number of enemies, he gives four reasons. All of these reasons, he announced he's going to Tabuk. So there's no surprise, everybody knew that they were going. And as I mentioned last week, uh, the battle of Tabuk was Fard Ain on every single capable Muslim. That's why Ka'ab made a mistake by not going. It was a sin not to go, a major sin not to go. Because the Prophet is commanding you, you have to go. So every capable, able-bodied Muslim had to go. So Ka'ab says, I move on now. The Prophet announced to the Muslims clearly their destination so that they might prepare for the Ghazwa. And he informed them of where he was going. And he said, the number of people that accompanied the Prophet Sallallahu were so numerous that they could not be listed in any kitab or diwan. So Ka'ab says, the number of people who came, I couldn't even write them for you in a kitab or a diwan. Diwan is a register they would use in those times. And this demonstrates for us the large quantity, uh, as we have said, in the history of the Seerah, the Battle of Tabuk is considered to be the largest number of soldiers marching behind the Prophet ﷺ. And the books of Seerah give estimates. And I have mentioned to you many times that uh, these estimates, in my humble opinion, need to be taken with a little bit of skepticism or, or, or healthy skepticism. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Astaghfirullah, nobody is accusing the historians or the tabi'un of lying. Astaghfirullah. But there's human nature involved. That when you make a guesstimate, human nature is you tend to inflate you know, the numbers. It's human nature. And especially for the enemies. That when you win the battle, it's human nature. You see a large group and you will say, oh, it was 10,000, 50,000. And the numbers that are reported in some of these battles, uh, it's simply beyond what would really have been taking place at that time. So the number that is typically reported is around 30,000. But, but quite frankly, 30,000 seems to be maybe a bit larger. Maybe there were 15, 20,000 in my opinion. Because if the, if the incident of Hudaybiyah, I'm sorry, of uh, the conquest of Mecca and whatnot, and Hunayn, we can maybe you know double it even safely. But to say that within six months, uh, 30, 35,000, it seems like a very large number. And Allah knows best. In the end of the day, these numbers are not uh, what is important. It's the morals that are important. But the point of Kaab here underscores my point. Did anybody count them? No. Kaab says, I couldn't count them. That's what he's saying. There are too many to count. And I couldn't fill a registrar with them. So imagine a registrar in those days, however much was the Dawawin, I couldn't fill, a di so thousands and thousands of names beyond what a Diwan or Dawawin would, uh, would uh, be able to uh, be written in. And he said, any man who intended to be absent assumed that the matter would remain hidden unless Allah revealed it through Wahi. Meaning what? Because the number was so much we thought we could slip under the radar. 
there was this notion that, okay, if we don't go, who's going to notice? But there was the fear or risk of Allah exposing through wahi, that these people did not go. Then he goes on. So the Prophet wasallam fought this ghazwa at the time when, number one, the fruits had ripened. And number two, the shade was so sweet. Meaning, harvest season and burning hot. Right? So the Prophet decided to go when the fruits of my garden are becoming lush and ripened. I need to get them. And the shade is ever so sweet. And I was more eager for those two than the ghazwa. So he's being honest here. He's being totally open here that my heart was more inclined to my fruits and my garden and my shade than the thought of leaving all of the comfort of my house and marching in the desert for a month going to uh, Tabuk. And the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba continued to prepare for the battle. And I started to go out every day in order to prepare myself. But every day would go by and I would come back without doing anything. So the announcement was made around 10 days was given of preparation. Every day people are going to the marketplace buying stuff, you need to buy stuff for your own journey, you need to take care of your family, you need to make sure your children are taken care of, find people that are going to you know, harvest the crops, it's not as if there's going to be nobody in the city, there will be legitimate people who remain behind, so you can make sure that somebody does it. So you arrange your affairs, and the Sahaba are busy doing this. As for Kaab, he says, every day I would leave and I'd have the to-do list. And one thing led to another and I'd come back home and the to-do list has not been even started. How many of us can sympathize with that, right? And he said, every day I would say, say to myself that I can do it the next day, no big deal. I kept on delaying, he said, until finally the people got ready to depart and the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims left the next morning. So they left right after Salat al-Fajr, by the way, we'll come to that later on. And I had not done anything on my to-do list. I had not done anything for the preparations and I said to myself, okay, I'll do it today or tomorrow and catch up to them. Now, remember, you have 15, 20,000 people marching, so the march is going to be extremely slow. So a single rider would not have any problem catching up to them in a day or two. Okay, so Ka'ab, when they leave, he says, khalas, I'll do it today. And that day went by and once again, I did nothing, and the next day as well did nothing. Ya laytani, how I wish I had done something back then. He's telling his son. Ya laytani, how I wish, what a mistake I made for not doing something. After two days, khalas, the opportunity is gone. You're not gonna, three days is too much to catch up uh, for one rider. And this really shows us the evils of procrastination, delaying. This really shows us the evils of delaying that which you can do now for tomorrow. And wallahi subhanallah, this deserves a khutbah. I was thinking today that wallahi we need to give a whole khutbah about procrastination. But maybe I'll give it another week inshaAllah ta'ala. You didn't get the joke. Anyway, okay. Uh, the issue of procrastination, taswif, it's called in Arabic, taswif, sofa, I'll do it. Uh, the issue of procrastination, subhanAllah, if you look at the text of the Quran and Sunnah, it's all action based when it comes to Iman. What does Allah say? Sari'u ila maghfiratim rabbikum. Rush and race to uh, your Lord. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? That warabbaka fakabir qum fa'andir. Stand up. Get rid of your, your sheet. Stand up and go warn the people. What does uh, um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say when Musa comes to Allah uh, in, in Tur Sayna in Mount Tur? What does he say? Wa ajiltu ilayka. I race to meet you, O oh Allah. So the whole Quran is full of these action items and verbs. And therefore, it is the person who doesn't have those action items that has a deficiency in imam procrastination is from shaitan and uh, many of our scholars commented on this that ibn al jawzi says procrastination is the most important weapon of shaitan procrastination is the most important weapon of shaitan because he uses it for everything for everything he says, ah tomorrow i'll do this tomorrow i'll do this and uh, ibn al qayyim says Every time a door of good opens up in front of you, the doors of perhaps and soon also open up to compete with it. Meaning what? Every time you have an opportunity to do, to do good, shaitan tempts you with two things. Number one, perhaps or what if, meaning, do I really need to do this? What if I did this instead? And then the second door is soon, meaning I'll do it in a while. 
and you end up not doing anything. So we learn from this the dangers of procrastination that Ka'ab did not intend to remain behind. Even though he was honest, he said, I preferred the, 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 the shelter of my house, but he didn't make up his mind not to go. Rather, what happened was Shaytan continued to procrastinate him, procrastinate him, procrastinate him until it was too late. And he realized, khalas, I cannot do anything now. And I mean, subhanAllah, these days there's so much written by, you know, the people who write in business and management and whatnot, that one of the, you know, uh, most effective habits of, of productive people is that they don't procrastinate. They do what is on their to-do list as soon as possible. And we learn this from our religion as well. We learn this from the story of Ka'b ibn Malik as well. So, he goes on to his story that such was the case with me, meaning I kept on procrastinating until they departed and they hurried away and the battle was completely missed by me. And after the departure of the Prophet wasallam, whenever I went outside and walked amongst the remaining people, it grieved me, it hurt me that I could see no one left in the city except one who was known for his hypocrisy or one who was infirm and weak and so Allah had excused him. So he's walking around the city, the city is empty. The whole city of Medina is empty. The only people left, one of two, either the limp or the weak or the elderly, the very infirm or somebody who was known for hypocrisy. And this shows us that the people who were munafiqun were well known. Even though in the Sharia ah, we do not pronounce them to be a munafiq. We leave their affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet still, the actions of the people of Nifaq are well known. And look at what he is saying. The only people left in the city were those who were well known for their Nifaq. Meaning, and this is by the way a very important point in one sense, and that is that uh, the groups that do not like the Sahaba, uh, I should say the group that does not like the Sahaba, they say that the Quran clearly mentions there are munafiqun amongst them. How do you know which ones they are? And this narration is one of the evidences we can use to say, look, the Sahaba are not naive. They know who is righteous outwardly and who is munafiq outwardly, but the Sharia says don't pronounce verdicts on people, leave their affair to Allah. And here we have this narration, the people who were known for nifaq. And we don't think about this point that the bulk of these people, their names have not been preserved in the seerah. Other than their leader, Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul, we know. But the bulk of the people, their names have just been overlooked. Why is this? We mentioned so many times. That it is not of the etiquettes of the sahaba, of our religion, to mention evil by name. We just gloss over it. Cover it up. And therefore the bulk of these names are not known to us. We just have tidbits here. So he then moves on. So he's, he's depressed. He's going to the city. The whole city is empty other than these two categories. Then he says, The Prophet wasallam did not remember me until they actually reached Tabuk. Until they reached Tabuk. Now, they reached Tabuk and he camped at Tabuk. Uh, we'll mention the difference of opinion, but some say 10 days, some say 19 days. He camped at Tabuk for quite a while. He camped at Tabuk, almost a month he camped at Tabuk. And uh, in that time, he remembered, where is Ka'b? I haven't seen Ka'b. And a man from the Banu Salama said, when he asked him, where is Ka'b? A man from the Banu Salama, his own tribe, he's from the Banu Salama. He's from the Banu Salama. A man from the Banu Salama said, Ya Rasulullah, his two garments and his looking at his properties and possessions have kept him back. It's an expression in Arabic which means his fine clothes and his cushions and sofas have kept him back. Meaning, he preferred this dunya over the next. That's what he's accusing of, right? That he became greedy and he wants to remain in his gardens and, and, and enjoy himself while we are out here. Then Mu'adh ibn Jabal said, وَيْحَكَ مَاذَا تَقُولُ Woe to you. Why are you saying this to the man who said this? Wallahi ya Rasulullah, I only know Ka'b to be a good man. Now what did we just notice here? The man who criticized, who was he? What's his name? We don't know. That was what I want you to point out. The one who praised, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he's mentioned. 
Do you not think Kaab knows who criticized him? And Kaab knows who praised him? Right? And here is now a chance to get back at the guy. Even though he's his own tribe, he must be even more angry. Mu'ad is not from the Banu Salama. Another tribesman defends him. His own tribesman criticizes him. And yet, Kaab rises above this pettiness. And when it comes to narrate the story, one of the people of Banu Salama. SubhanAllah, how many times in the seerah? Wallahi, even sitting here talking to you, how many times have I brought this point up? In so many instances of the seerah, at least a dozen times in the seerah, we come across this point. And this really shows us the etiquette of the Sahaba, how I wish we could follow that as well. To overlook, just don't mention, if you have to mention, be anonymous, somebody, one of the people. No need to, to, to keep this legacy and this gossip and this, and wallahi, this culture of ours, astaghfirullah, is the exact opposite. It loves gossip. It thrives on gossip. There are shows and, and television things and, and magazines that are just dedicated to... Isn't there a magazine called Gossip? I'm not, right? There is, right? right? Something that... Yes. I mean, the whole thing and the shows as well. SubhanAllah, our religion is the exact opposite. And I've mentioned this so many times. So, Mu'adh ibn Jabal defended him. And this shows us as well, why is Mu'adh Mu'adh and why is the anonymous person lost in history? That Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he is the faqih. He is the alim. Our Prophet ﷺ said the one who is the most knowledgeable of halal and haram in my ummah is Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And memorize this beautiful hadith of our Prophet ﷺ. Whoever defends the honor of his brother in his absence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will defend him from the fire of hell. Whoever defends the honor of his brother in his absence, that defense will become your defense against Jahannam. And Mu'adh is the one doing this. So next time you're in a gathering and you hear somebody slandered, smeared, what not, stand up and defend that brother. If, you, if he is somebody you know, obviously, if it's not, then you change the topic. You shouldn't be backbiting anyway. But if it's someone that you know to be good, then remember this hadith. Whoever defends his brother in his absence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will defend his face from the fire of uh, hell. And also notice as well, the Prophet is monitoring the Sahaba. He notices Ka'ab is missing. No doubt he noticed him after 10 days. But after all, Ka'ab is not of the Ashara Mubashara. Ka'ab is a little bit below that, right? So eventually he notices and he's monitoring. Where is Ka'ab? I have not seen Ka'ab. And uh, then he is told Ka'ab did not come basically. And Mu'adh defends Ka'ab, uh, ibn, uh, uh, Ka'ab ibn Malik. Then the Prophet saw somebody in the distance while he's camped at Tabuk. He sees a rider coming. The, 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 the narration says, breaking the mirage. It's so beautiful because when the rider is coming from the distance, the mirage will be broken, right? We see this on television when the horse is galloping and whatnot, it breaks the mirage. So Kaab says somebody was riding, breaking the mirage. And the Prophet ﷺ saw the rider and he said, let it be Abu Khaythama. Let it be Abu Khaythama. And lo and behold, it was Abu Khaythama. Abu Khaythama is one of the other Sahaba, inshallah, we'll talk about his story as well. Uh, and... Uh, Abu Khaythama, uh, he, had, he didn't have the money to go. He didn't have the money to go. And he, when the Prophet called for donations, all he had was a handful of dates. So he donated those dates. That's all he had. And he donated the, those dates. And Abdullah ibn Ubayn, the Munafiqun, were in the masjid, and they made fun of this. And they said, uh, what will these dates do to finance an entire army? So Allah revealed in the Quran, الَّذِينَ يَلْمِزُونَ الْمُطَّوِّعِينَ مِنَ الْمُنِرِ فِي الصَّدَقَاتِ Right, Allah revealed in the Quran verses criticizing Abdullah ibn Ubay. Those who are sarcastic to those who donate of their charity. Allah criticized Abdullah ibn Ubay and praised uh, Abu Khaythama. And Abu Khaythama did not have the money. SubhanAllah, eventually he manages to get a camel way after the process has gone. And single-handedly he's riding all the way to Tabuk. And the Prophet ﷺ, and he was of those who cried. Allah mentions in the Quran, and again we'll get to this story next week or the week after that, that Allah mentions a group in the Quran, they cried, we don't have anything. And Abu Khaytham was one of them. And now, uh, alhamdulillah, he manages to get a mount. So single-handedly, across the entire Arabian Peninsula, over a thousand miles, he comes from Medina all the way to Tabuk. And the Prophet ﷺ wants him so bad, when he sees a rider out of all of the people left behind, he said, let it be Abu Khaythama. And of course, Allah made it to be Abu Khaythama. So Abu Khaythama makes his way to Tabuk. And eventually, of course, the Prophet ﷺ uh, comes back to Medina. So Kaab says, the riwayah goes on. When I heard that the Prophet ﷺ was on his way back, my concerns deepened. 
And my mind went to every single excuse I could think of, saying to myself, what can I say to avoid the anger of the Prophet when he returns? So his mind is now going every single place. And I took the advice of the senior members of my family, of my tribe, asking around. And when I found out that the Prophet had returned, all of these false excuses disappeared from my mind. And I knew that I could never come out of this problem with any false statement. Now I'm in this problem, it's not going to be solved with any false statement. فَعَزَمْتُ I made a decision that I would just confess and tell the truth. And this shows us the reality of Iman, that subhanAllah the mu'min might fall into a mistake, but he does not remain in that mistake. And again we have the story of Adam and Iblis over and over again, so many benefits from that story. Both made a mistake. The one said, I'm sorry, may Allah, uh, I'm sorry, oh Allah, forgive me. And the other one, he persisted in his mistake. And that is one of the main differences between Adam and Iblis. Iman, yes, it can slip. Nobody is perfect. You can make a major sin. But then Iman will cause you to rise up and continue down. And this also shows us that nothing saves you from a mistake other than genuine ikhlas to Allah. Nothing will save you from the effects of your mistake and sin other than sincerity. And that is why our Prophet ﷺ said, Anadamu tawbah, feeling guilty is the essence of tawbah. Because when you feel guilty, why would you feel guilty? When do you feel guilty? When you acknowledge you made the mistake. Or else you know, you don't feel, if you don't want to acknowledge even, you're not going to feel guilty. So feeling guilty is the essence of repentance. Without it, there is no repentance. So Ka'ab realized the only way out is to be honest. And he tells the story that when the Prophet ﷺ arrived uh, in the morning, he would always pray two raka'at uh, in the masjid and then welcome the people uh, uh, in the masjid. And he would sit in the masjid getting the visitors to come. So when he had done all of this, the stragglers, those of us who remained behind, we all came the next day in a long line to offer our excuses. And he said, we were around 80 something in number. So in the whole city of Medina, only 80 something adult males remained. Imagine, the entire city deserted. Only 80 or so remained. And by the way, of those 80, some of them have actual legitimate excuses, meaning they were physically sick, right? The bulk of them were hypocrites, no doubt, of this 80. Because those who couldn't go had already given the excuse. Because those who were sick and one of their excuses known. And um, um, the, uh, Ibn Umm Maktoum, the blind Sahabi, did not need to give an excuse. He doesn't have to stand in line. It's understood he's not going to go. So those who have the legitimate excuse, by and large, they're not lining up. A few of them might have had legitimate excuses. But the bulk of these 80 are hypocrites. And by the way, this also shows us how many were the munafiqun of Medina? Small perfection. Medina at this time, the least it would have is around 4,000 people. The least it would have. After all of these battles and hijrah and whatnot, the minimum. There is no authentic quota, but we can guesstimate. And easily around four to 5,000 people. Of them, maybe you know 70 or so are these hypocrites lining up. So look at the quantity, small quantity. They know who they are. So they all line up in front of the Prophet wasallam, And they gave their excuses and they beg the Prophet ﷺ for Allah's forgiveness and the Prophet ﷺ accepted those excuses and left their secrets to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, number of points here. Uh, of them is a neglected sunnah that hardly anybody follows and I am just as guilty as the rest of you that it's not a part of our sunnah anymore to pray two rak'at when we return to our city. That it is sunnah that when we return to our city, we should go to the masjid and basically pray two rak'at yani of thankfulness of whatever. It is a sunnah that our Prophet would always do. That whenever he returned, he would, first thing he would do, he would pray two rak'at in the masjid of the Prophet And of course, wherever we are, we should pray in the masjid, our local masjid, when we come back. Also, an interesting point here, which we will come back to later on. I'm just going to zoom over it now. The Prophet, because I'm going to zoom over because Kaab's narration does not mention the details, but we're going to come back in a later lecture about the Quran that was revealed in the Battle of Tabuk. And of those verses is the verse that our Prophet is 
mildly chastised by Allah for forgiving. May Allah or Allah will forgive you. So Allah begins by saying, Allah will forgive you. Why did you accept all of this uh, excuses? You should have waited until you test who is truthful, who has legitimate excuse from those who don't have the legitimate excuse. And this shows us that, of course, Allah Azza wa Jal allowed the Prophet to do this eventually. Uh, by the way, this also shows us over and over again, and I've said this point at least 12 times by now, ijtihad of the Prophet the theological point. Did our Prophet practice his own ijtihad? And this incident and the verse clearly shows Allah has forgiven you but why did you let go of them right and it also shows us the nature of our process that all of these hypocrites are inventing the wildest excuses and he's saying okay 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 and this shows us his tender nature that it's obvious they're lying it's obvious and yet our process is accepting because we judge people on outward and the guy is saying something, then khalas, believe him, leave his affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then it was my turn, Kaab says. And when I came up to him, and I love this phrase so beautifully, so, such a beautiful phrase. He says, he smiled to me the way that an angry man smiles. Because you see, when you're angry, you don't smile the full smile that when you're happy. And yet he smiled. Now generally, if you're angry, you're not going to smile in the face of the person, right? We speak from our own experiences. When you're irritated at somebody, when you're angry at somebody, you will scowl. You will make sure your lips are dead straight. I'm not even going to give you the least sadaqah of smiling. That's how angry I am, right? But our Prophet he's not like that. The fact that he's angry at Ka'ab, firstly, it's a positive sign because he's disappointed in him. He's not dis the hypocrites are expected. Right? The fact that he feels this anger. Why you, Ka'ab? It shows that Ka'ab had a higher standard in his eyes. You following me? Right? Why you of all people? You as well? You're in this line? So he is irritated at Ka'ab. But he still smiles in his face, subhanAllah. And Ka'ab realizes this is not the smile of a happy person. Because even when you're angry, you cannot fully control your emotions. What a beautiful, yani, subhanAllah, window into you know, the interaction of our Prophet. He's still smiling because that is his nature. But Ka'ab senses this is not the smiling of a happy person. This is smiling of an angry person. And he says, what is your excuse, O Ka'ab? I mean, I've heard all of these excuses. What is your excuse, O Ka'ab? Did you not have good health? Were you not... Uh, didn't you purchase a camel? So he tells to Kaab, didn't you purchase a camel? And subhanAllah, I mean, I'm amazed here. Our process, I mean, obviously he's monitoring every Sahabi. And Kaab is not of the elite 10. I mean, yes, he's well known, but he's not, you know, of that level, that the, 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 the inner, inner, inner circle, he's not of that. Yet our process is aware. Didn't you purchase a camel? You brought two camels. I, I know this, you have a second camel. And so Kaab said that, Wallahi, O Messenger of Allah, Wallahi, Ya Rasulullah, that if I were sitting in front of any other person from this whole world, I would have been able to wiggle my way out in front of him and avoid getting his anger. By Allah, he says, I have been bestowed the power of speaking fluently and eloquently. I have the gift of the gab. I have an eloquent tongue. But if I were to tell you a lie today to please you, Allah would expose me and make you angry at me tomorrow. But if I were to tell you the truth, even though you might be angry at me today, I can hope that Allah will forgive me. Ya Rasul Allah, I swear by Allah, I have no excuse. SubhanAllah, just admitted it. I have no excuse. I have nothing to say. I have never been healthier or stronger or wealthier than right before the battle of Tabuk. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Amma hadha faqad sadaq. As for this man, he has spoken the truth. Not like the guys before him. And this shows he knows these people, the other ones are lying. He knows it, but it is his gentle nature. As for this man, he has spoken the truth. So stand up and basically go away 
and Allah will decide your fate. Now, before we move on here, I mean, one of the most profound points here really is the issue of Tawheed versus Maqamullah versus Maqamul Nabi Wasallam. Clearly, we have this here. And this distinction is especially essential when we look at the modern groups out there and the way that you know, they view Huququllah versus Huququl Nabi Wasallam. You know, especially the, the, the Sufi groups and the extreme or the Balilvi groups, for example. Here we have Ka'ab ibn Malik. What is he saying to the Prophet ﷺ? He says, Ya Rasulullah, I can get out of your anger, but Allah would know the truth. And if you're angry at me today, maybe if I speak the truth, Allah will forgive me. Clearly, Ka'ab understands, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. It is Allah's pleasure he needs to seek. And even if he manages to convince Rasulullah Allah is not going to be happy with him if he lies. But if the Prophet is angry at him today, if he is truthful and repentant to Allah, Allah will forgive him eventually. Imagine that, right? And subhanAllah, these days we have so many groups that they have really reversed the order. And they quite literally say that our Prophet is in charge of heaven and hell. That whoever he decides will go to heaven, whoever he decides will go to hell. Then they give him so many powers and whatnot, and this is not our religion. Our Prophet is the greatest human being, but he is not God, nor the son of God, nor the intercessor to God. No, he is a human being, the greatest, the best, the most merciful, but he is not divine. And in the end of the day, we don't worship him, we worship his creator and sender. And so Ka'ab understood this point. And he basically, and this beautifully, he summarizes Tawheed. So he gets up and walks away. And he said, when I walked away, the members of my tribe who were in the masjid, they gathered around me and they followed me all the way home. And they said, Ya Ka'ab, you were a good man up until today. We never saw any evil from you. You're well known, meaning you're one of our best men. You know, you were in the good list of the Prophet wasallam. Why didn't you join the others with their excuses? Why did you have to embarrass yourself and then embarrass us? Because again, it's all in the end, there is this sense of tribalism, right? In the end, there is this sense of tribalism. You're one of us. And by sticking out from the crowd in this manner, basically, why did you have to do this? Surely, you could have joined the rest of them and the Prophet would have just asked for your forgiveness as he asked for their forgiveness as well, right? So his tribesmen surround him and they say, go back give it another chance, make an excuse up. And he said, they continued to convince me until I almost was going to go back. SubhanAllah, notice here, right? That the, the effects of people that are not that righteous, that they're going to convince me to go back until I ask them, did anybody else of that long line also say they have no excuse? And so they said, yes, there were two men in that 80 plus line, two people, so three total, three total who basically confessed and said, we have no excuse, O Messenger of Allah. I said, who are they? They said, Murara ibn al-Rabi al-Amri and Hilal ibn Umayya al-Waqifi. Murara and Hilal. And Ka'ab says, Wallahi, they mentioned to me two men of Iman and Taqwa. Two men, the both of whom had attended the battle of Badr. They're Badriyun. And in their company was barakah for me, was blessings for me. So I said, khalas, if they are with this position, I'm going to stay with them rather than the other munafiqun in that line. Right? And this shows us the importance of quality over quantity. 80 plus men, all giving some baloney excuses. And two others said the truth. But those 80 plus are not worth anything. They're not known for anything. And those two were both Badriyun. So those two outweighed the all 80. And this shows us truth is not judged by numbers. Truth is not judged by quantity. Truth is judged by quality. Who is on? Who is the one saying this? And this also shows us the importance of righteous companionship. That he didn't want to be with the Banu Salama opinion. He wanted to be with the opinion of the two uh, Badris. And so uh, Ka'ab goes on and he says, The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he forbade all of the Muslims to talk or interact with us. All three of us, out of those who remained behind in the Ghazwa. Now notice the Bunafiqun did not get any punishment in this world. They're simply 
overlooked in this world. Their punishment will await in the hereafter. And this also shows us the wisdom of worldly punishments. And this applies not just to the Islamic State punishments of the Hudud, but also to any pain and suffering in this world. That the believer understands every pain and suffering and every punishment as something that will eliminate the pain and suffering of the next world. And that is why it is the believers who are punished now. As for the munafiqun, they got away scot-free in this world. And the next, what, what awaits them will await them. So the command came down that nobody was to interact with us, speak with us, say anything to us until Allah Azza wa Jal allowed them to do so. So we kept away from the people. And the people's attitude towards us changed so much that it appeared to me that I am a foreigner and stranger in my own land. And the world, despite its vastness, became a constricted place for me. And subhanAllah, this shows us, and it's something we know that if one of our loved ones does not speak to us, how much does it hurt us? If just one of our loved ones. Imagine if all of our loved ones and friends and acquaintances, all of them began boycotting us. We can only imagine because this doesn't happen in the real life. It does not happen. Imagine if the whole society, you became a ghost. Wherever you go, nobody can look at you. Nobody can say anything to you. Imagine how you would feel. And this is what happened to Ka'ab ibn Malik. And that is why abandonment of a person, in fact, it is a, a, an Islamic discipline. The Quran, says, the Quran says that when the spouses are having a major problem and the one of them is not listening, one of the mechanisms is abandonment. You abandon. That, okay, I'm not going to speak to you. This is a tool that you basically get the message across. And, of course, the general rule is that uh, it is not allowed to abandon somebody for more than uh, three days due to a personal dispute. However, in an Islamic land, the Khalifa could issue a punishment for a particular person if there is a need to do so. This is called ta'zir or a discretionary punishment. It is one of the mechanisms of ta'zir or discretionary uh, punishment. So Ka'ab says, we remained in our city becoming strangers in our own land and nobody spoke to us. Now what I also find amazing here that in this whole city not a single person disobeyed the Prophet And there's no police force monitoring, there's no secret NSA looking at your phone calls and cell phones and video, nothing. But when the Prophet says, don't, the whole city does not do it. That type of leadership can only come from Iman. Where you just, and this is something that is so difficult to imagine, that you are not supposed to look at him, say anything to you, ignore him completely. And the whole city follows suit. And he said, we remained in this condition for 50 nights. Imagine, 50 nights. Imagine, for 50 nights. Wallahi, I mean, think about that. For one day, it's impossible for us to imagine. For 50 days. And Kaab says, as for my two other companions, the other two, uh, Sahaba, Murara and uh, Hilal, they locked themselves in their houses. And they did not interact with the people because it was too painful for them. And they wept day and night about their uh, situation. But for me, I was the youngest and the, the most outgoing, the most social of them. I was the youngest and the most firmest of them. So I would intentionally walk in the marketplace, trying to find somebody to talk to, right? I would intentionally walk in the marketplace. And I would witness the salawat with the Prophet He would walk into the masjid of the Prophet and pray along with the Muslims in the rows. But no one would look at me or talk to me. And I would go daily to the Prophet wasallam and greet him in front of everyone. And I would wonder whether his lips would move in response, but I wouldn't see anything. SubhanAllah, imagine that pain when the Prophet himself is ignoring you. Allah, this is by the way, of course, Allah gave the punishment, right? This is something in the, that Allah revealed. It's not in the Quran, the punishment, but the lifting of the punishment is there. So the punishment itself, it was wahi, that is not from the Qur'an. So the punishment comes out and even the Prophet ﷺ does not return my uh, greetings. And when I would say my salah, I would notice that he would be looking at me stealthily. When I would look to him, he would turn away. Meaning what? Ka'ab obviously wants attention. 
He wants attention and he's monitoring. Is the Prophet even know, knowing that I exist? Is he noticing me? And he realizes that when he goes into the corner, the Prophet is looking at him, which means what? Even the Prophet wants mercy for Ka'b. He wants him and he's remembering him, right? And subhanAllah, this, this also reminds me of um, a study I, I read a little while ago that they said one of the worst forms of modern torture is isolation. You know the, the um, isolation in the cells that they have, the, the prison cells, right? The solitary confinement. The solitary confinement. That in fact, certain uh, agencies in the UN and also, what is that, um, amnesty and whatnot, they say that this is inhumane. That isolating somebody completely is inhumane. Now, of course, this isn't that type of isolation because he's physically walking around. But the type of isolation that happens in uh, these prisons, as you know, you literally have no human contact. Nobody speaks to you, nobody talks to you, whatnot. And there are people that have been in that isolation and they, uh, and they come out of it and they write their memoirs. Wallahi, you read what they write and like, it's so sad that some of them would say that I would not mind the torture to resume, if, especially if they're in third world countries. I would rather be tortured, at least have some human, than to be left for weeks and months on end. And of course, the food is just put in through a, 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 a chute or something like this, just throw it in. Nobody sees even another human being for weeks and months on end. So this is a type of psychological torture when it happens there. Of course, now, Kaab is in the city, he's not cut off, so the torture is not to that level, but it is a punishment. It's a punishment that is definitely uh, hurting him. And he said, with this harsh attitude, when it continued to last, I felt so exasperated that I finally went to my best friend and my cousin. Abu Qatada. And I went to his house and I jumped over the wall as I would always do. So he has a garden and it's a public garden, meaning it's not his inner house. And I jumped over the wall and my, my cousin Abu Qatada was sitting there. And I said, and I said salam to him. السلام, he didn't even respond to me. Like he's one thing, he's so desperate for human companionship. He just wants a salam. He goes to his best friend, he's grown up with him as his cousin, the one that he basically socializes with, chills out with. He goes to his best friend and he says salam and he doesn't even look at him. Does not even look at him. So he's basically almost losing it now. And he says, Ya Aba Qatada, I ask you by Allah, don't you know me to be a Muslim who loves Allah and his messenger? I mean, you know me. I am a person who loves Allah and His Messenger. He didn't even look at me. I asked him again, begging and pleading now, that don't you know me? In the name of Allah, Bismillah, I'm asking you, don't you know me to be a man who loves Allah and His Messenger? And Abu Qatada can prohibit it, ignores him. For the third time, and he's now begging and crying. And so Abu Qatada just answers up into the air, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and His Messenger know if you have Iman or not. I mean, He doesn't answer him because He's not supposed to, right? He just speaks into the air that Allah and His Messenger know best, which is a factual statement. So it's not as if He's disobeying. He just says a factual statement. In every circumstance, Allah and His Messenger knows best. Can you imagine the impact on Kaab? Can you imagine how that would affect Kaab? That everybody appears to abandon Kaab. And He said, the tears began just bursting forth from me. And I rushed home, jumped over the wall and returned back to my house. Wallahi, we cannot even imagine. You know, it's something 50 days, nobody even speaks to you. And then your best friend and your, 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 your confidant himself does not even know. And of course, this was the punishment, right? This is exactly why this was happening. This was the expiation, the kafara. Allah is using this so that khalas, they come out much better than they walked into uh, the situation. And Kaab said that in those last days when I was walking in the marketplace, so I saw a, uh, a, a Nabati, uh, a Nabati uh, from Nabat, from the Nabataeans, uh, uh, basically somebody from up north, a uh, Christian from up north, from the Nabataeans of Sham. He had come down to Medina to sell his grain. And he was asking as he's selling the grain, who can tell me where is Ka'b ibn Malik? Who can tell me where is Ka'b ibn Malik? So the people just pointed, that is Ka'b ibn Malik. So he came to me and he said, I have a letter for you from the king of the Ghassanids. The king of the Ghassanids. Now pause here. The battle of Tabuk was against whom? The Ghassanids. Right? So the Prophet has come back from trying to fight the Ghassanids. They fled. 
They didn't fight him. They didn't have the, the guts to, to fight with him. They fled. But they know that the Prophet was there to fight. And so they clearly have spies in Medina. Perhaps some of the Munafiqun. They clearly have spies in Medina. And the spies are reporting what's going on. And of the reports that goes up, one of the elite of the Ansar, he has been abandoned. So within these 50 days, the spies go back and report. And the king sends a letter to Ka'ab ibn Malik. And he says to proceed. I have been informed that your friend has treated you coldly. And Nabi Wasallam has treated you coldly. And Allah would not allow you to live at a place where you are inferior and your rights are lost. Join us and we will console you and make you happy. Now why would the king of the Ghassan is want to reach out to Ka'b ibn Malik? Who can explain this to me? Why would the king want to do this? Excellent. Inflict breakage in the ranks. You're breaking the sufuf of the Muslims. What else? Cause pain to the Prophet, to the, Prophet to the Sahaba that I have one of yours. Also, it's a matter of pride that we, I have one of yours now. right? So not just causing pain, but it's a trophy piece. right? I got one of yours on my side. Okay. Also, to know the inner mechani- uh, mechanisms and dynamics of the Sahaba. And, you know, just like to be a type of spy or something. Like, you know, to information, source of information, right? I mean, uh, America and Russia do this all the time, don't they? So many different countries do all the time. You want to have the informants and the confidants come over. You know, they, they, they seek political asylum, they get lots of money. But it's not just about the money, it's about the prestige. It's about inflicting wound. How, how embarrassing is it when an ambassador of a country defects over? Right? It's very embarrassing. So the king of the Ghassan is once this elite Sahabi. The king of the Ghassan is once this elite Sahabi. So he sends him an offer. That come over, you will be very happy over here. And Ka'b ibn Malik says that as soon as I read it, I said to myself, this is also of the test. This is also of the test. And I immediately took it to my stove, my furnace, the oven in the house, right? And burnt it in that oven. Now, subhanAllah, wallahi, this is so beautiful that it's one thing to pass the test. And for that you need iman. It's another thing to recognize this is a test. And for that you need knowledge. Ka'ab understands why this is happening to him. Isn't that amazing? Like he says, this is of the test. And that is not just Iman. Iman will let you pass a test. And you need Iman to pass the test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But knowledge will help you analyze the test. Knowledge will help you understand the, the dynamics of what's happening. And that obviously helps you to pass the test as well. And here is what we see. That Ka'ab ibn Malik subhanAllah, he understands exactly what is going on. And he says... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing me even more now with this issue and I'm not going to fall for this uh, trap. And so in order that he doesn't have any second doubts, he destroys the letter. Obviously it would have had more information and whatnot, what to do and whatnot. He destroys it immediately, burns it up, incinerates it so that he cannot even double guess himself. And this really shows us subhanAllah that iman is, is important but knowledge is also important. And the best combination is iman and knowledge. You can have iman without knowledge. You can have knowledge without iman. But the best combination is true iman with genuine knowledge uh, put together. And that is what Ka'b had. And so he said 50 days went by. Then on the 50th morning, a messenger came from Rasulullah. So some one of the messengers, one of the people came. And he said, O Ka'b, the Prophet wasallam is commanding you to leave your wife. So I said immediately, should I divorce her or send her to her parents? So the messenger said, no, don't divorce. Just don't have any relations with her. Send her back. Don't have any relations with her. You know, biological relations. Now, he sent her back. He sent the wife back to the parents. Now, again, we see, wallahi, amazing. After 50 days, a command comes that is so painful. Even your wife boycott her. You can't even be with your wife. You are alone in the house. You will be literally just alone. Everybody has to leave. Just you. And as soon as the command comes, 
Ka'ab doesn't say, why? For how long? When? What does Ka'ab say? Do you want me to divorce or do you want me to leave? Meaning he wants to jump at the command of the Prophet ﷺ. Ya Rasulullah, you say and I will do it. Wallahi, look at that iman. That the command is ambiguous and vague. Leave your wife, meaning what? Does he want me to divorce her? I'll divorce her right now. Does he want me to let her go? I'll... Subhanallah, what type of iman is this? Wallahi? After 50 days of being psychologically put in this condition, then a future test comes and he immediately jumps up and he says, whatever Rasulullah wants, I will do this. And this is really what you call iman. And so the, 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 the messenger tells him, no, the Prophet said you just leave. And so uh, his wife went to the, the, the parents' house. Then he said, I found out from some of the other women of the family, they must have come and told him that uh, Hilal, his wife has gone to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and asked permission to live in the house without uh, and, and she said, Ya Rasulullah, Hilal is a very old man. Nobody will be able to take care of him. He cannot take care of himself. He's too old. So can I just give him his food? Can I just, you know, help him to eat and, and whatnot? So the Prophet him said, yes, but do not sleep with him. Do not be in the same bed as him. Do not have physical relations. So she said, Ya Rasulullah, ever since your command has come, he has had no need of me. He has been stuck to the wall. 50 days he has been crying all of those 50 days. He has never looked at me. Meaning that's not the issue, don't worry. That's not going to happen. Subhanallah, for 50 days, he has just been crying every day, just next to the wall. No, no sense of anything else other than repentance. This is, that's what he's saying. This is Hilal we're talking about, right? The, the older person, Hilal. So she's saying, Ya Rasulullah, don't worry. That's not going to happen. I just want to feed him. He's done, otherwise, nobody will take care of him. He's an old man. So she got permission to be in the house and cook his food. So some of the women of Kaab's extended family came and basically said, why don't you as well go and get permission? So they're trying to make life easy for him. And he said, what am I going to say as an excuse? I am the youngest of them. What excuse will I give? I cannot use this excuse in front of uh, the messenger uh, wasallam. No, I'm not going to do that. And so Ka'ab ibn Malik refused to do this and then a further 10 days went by and we'll have to stop at that cliffhanger right at the cliffhanger here. A further 10 days went by and then at the end of the 60th day, two full months was when uh, Allah Azza wa Jal uh, basically accepted their repentance. But that story, inshallah, we don't have time to finish it uh, before uh, Salat al-Isha. So inshallah, we will pause here. Uh, and continue next week, bi ta'ala. And because we're not finished, there's no point for Q&A. Q &A.